Western North Carolina Sierra Club, and I want to welcome you to our Bear Wise Barely There Safe Encounters with Bears, and want to welcome folks from all over the region and all over the state. But first of all, I want to acknowledge our ongoing concern about the injustices of systemic racism. Environmental issues cannot be separated from racial and social justice. I also, of course, want to acknowledge the virus, COVID-19, and the need for all of us to stay safe and well. We have changed our Sierra Club meetings to an online webinar format to keep you safe and to keep us safe. So right now, as you know, we are going to have our wonderful program with Ashley Hobbs, North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. But I want to tell you about our next, always the first Thursday of every month. We, of course, are online with a Zoom, and this will be August 6th. And this will be on plastics, problems, solutions, and how to recycle right. I have been told over and over again, nobody knows how to recycle anymore. The number ones on your plastic don't mean to recycle. This is going to be presented by the Greenworks Plastic Reduction Task Force, and you have to advance register like you did tonight on our Western North Carolina Sierra Club website, which is winoka.org. Along with this program, we're going to encourage you for the entire week before August 6th to click on our link, which will be posted to watch the movie as a precursor. It's called The Story of Plastics. Even if you have seen it once, I encourage you to see it again. Again, please pre-register for this, but you will be able to click on the link itself. I also want to challenge you, this is Plastic Free July, and this is a global movement of millions of people, and there is an eco-challenge asking you to refuse to use and reuse single-use plastics. Both of these websites are posted on winoka.org. I have started to take the eco-challenge to commit to not using any plastic for the whole month of July. Let me tell you, this is hard, but I want you to be aware, as you already know, that the oceans are clogged, but also the burning of plastics has put it into our atmosphere. It is raining down on our head, and we are also eating it in our food. So we need to stop single-use plastics. Our program two months from now, September 3rd, will be on uh, environmental equity. William Barber III, who is the son of Reverend Barber, will speak on environmental injustice, race, class, and climate change. Again, please pre-register, advanced registration on our winoka.org um, uh, website. We also want to encourage you now to go ahead and request an absentee ballot. Of course, we're all concerned about the virus and the safety of voting. There is no risk and no problem. You can go ahead and request uh, to get an absentee ballot and uh, you will get it in the mail in September. You can choose to not use it and go ahead and vote in person if you choose that. But to get this request, uh, print it out online, sign it, uh, just you, return it in three different ways, by snail mail, by fax, or by email. And again, this is posted on our winoka.org. So now I wanna to introduce to you Ashley Hobbs of the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission to talk uh, at length about safe encounters with bears and everything else. If you have questions, and please do have questions, use the Q&A down at the bottom of your screen, and we will give these questions to Ashley at the end of the program. Expect to go roughly an hour. So thank you, and here is Ashley. Thank you, Judy. I uh, just want to introduce myself very quickly. My name is Ashley Hobbs. I'm the assistant black bear biologist and fur bear biologist with NC Wildlife. Um, I'm based out of Buncombe County in Asheville, so I'm local to Western North Carolina. 
And I do a lot of talk about bear wise throughout our area. It's a very significant problem that we have in Western North Carolina. So I was very happy to come and speak to you guys today. And I'd love to just jump right in. Uh, let's get started here. All right. So today we're going to talk about bear wise again. Um, and we're going to kind of start with uh, some kind of general biology and move forward. But as we go along, I want to make sure that I'm very clear in what I'm saying. Uh, so if you have any clarification type questions, uh, go ahead and put those in the Q&A. If it's just kind of a general uh, question or a question more specific to your scenario, uh, just let me know in the Q&A at the end. I'll go ahead and address that. But that just kind of keeps things moving along there. So again, today we'll start with biology and behavior of black bears. We want to learn what's normal for a black bear, what's not normal, and what should we be on the lookout for around our communities. Uh, then we'll move on to coexisting with black bears, and we'll wrap it up with a little bit of interesting research that's going on in our area. So diving right in, uh, let's talk about the weight of our bears. We have some of the black, largest black bears in the world here in North Carolina. Um, the males can get up to 880 plus pounds. Uh, in fact, the largest black bear ever recorded was 880 pounds out of Craven County, North Carolina, so out on coastal North Carolina. Um, some of the biggest black bears in the world, some of the highest densities of black bears in the world are right here in North Carolina, out on our coastal counties. Um, as you can see here as well, our males are larger than our females on average. Um, and if you look a little bit closer, our coastal bears are on average also larger than our mountain bears. Um, so that probably surprises a lot of people and it certainly doesn't mean that we have small bears here in uh, western North Carolina. Uh, it just means that there's a lot more available for them on the coast year round. Uh, so they're getting to those big 600, 700, 800 pound ranges. So how are they getting this big? Well naturally they're eating uh, a lot of uh, plant material but they're also omnivores so they are eating some animals and insects. Uh, but about 80% of their diet compri is comprised of plants and when they get up from hibernation in the springtime, early spring, they're going to be going after those early roots and shoots. Um, a lot of insects as well are available at that time and so that comprises the majority of their diet. But as we get into this time of year where the berries are starting to ripen up, they'll s uh, switch over to what we call soft mass. So that's blueberries, blackberries, chokecherry, service berry, any of the berries out there that are available to them. Um, they will switch over. In the fall, they're going to be getting into this um, squaw root that you see right here. It's a pretty co uh, common thing to see on the trails when you're out hiking. Um, it has a lot of different names. Bear corn is another common name for it. Um, they're still going to be after, going after those insect uh, larvae, any sort of ants, uh, termites, hornets, wasps, anything like that they can get their paws on. Uh, in addition to any sort of livestock around the, around the year they can get into uh, goats, chickens, any small livestock. Uh, in the fall they're going to be switching over to a hard mass diet. So they're going to be picking up on those acorns, primarily white oak acorns, um, as, in addition to hickory and chestnuts as well. Um, around that time, particularly out on the coast, is when a lot of our crops start coming into uh, their prime and so a field of corn is like a buffet to a bear. They'll certainly utilize those as well. In the springtime, when the fawns drop, uh, the bears will go after those newborn fawns uh, before they can really get up and start running quickly. Uh, they'll also pick up any sort of detritus, so any dead animals they can come across, they will scavenge as well. But what will black bears eat if it's available? Well, pretty much anything. Um, they're very, very happy to come onto your porch and get your bird feeders, your hummingbird feeders. Uh, as you can see here, they'll get into your pet food on your back porch. Uh, same thing for garbage. Anything that's out there available to them that they can smell and get their paws on, they're going to try at least once. So let's talk a little bit about their senses. So you can see on the bears here, um, you know, they got these big satellite dish ears. They can have different colors, as you can see here on their muzzles. Um, but generally, they're going to be black. They can also be sort of a cinnamon color in our area as well. And in other areas of the country, they can even be a cream or a white color. Um, and anywhere in between, there's a, there's a pretty broad spectrum. Um, but when it comes to their senses, their eyesight is going to be pretty comparable to ours. They can see in colors just like we can, but they do have a little bit of trouble with that red and yellow uh, end of the spectrum. Same thing with orange. Uh, but when it comes to distance versus close up vision, their distance vision is not so great. Um, so I know my distance vision isn't great either, 
So if I can't see what something is in the distance, I get up and I get a better look at it. So you might see a bear stand up on its hind legs. And what that bear is doing is getting a better look. It's engaging its, all of its senses, its eyes, ears, nose, everything it's got to try and figure out what it is in front of it. Um, so it's often mistaken for an aggressive behavior for a bear that's trying to get you. Um, but it's not, it's a curious behavior. That bear is just trying to engage its senses to figure out what you are. Um, you might do the same thing if you are in the garden pulling weeds and you think you might have saw a bear out of the corner of your eye, so you stand up, turn around, get a better look to make sure you didn't actually see a bear. Um, they're doing the same thing, so that's a common misconception there. Also, their hearing is pretty acute. Uh, you see their big satellite dish ears here in these pictures. Um, they, actually, they actually have directional hearing, so they can pinpoint which direction that sound is coming from. Um, additionally, they can hear uh, frequencies much higher than what we can hear. So a lot of times when we're out hiking in the woods or something comparable to that, uh, they can hear us coming before we see them. Their sense of smell is excellent, and this is probably their top of their senses. Um, they can smell your garbage can from a mile away. They can smell your garbage can from some estimates 10 miles away, and some estimates even put that at 25 miles away. Uh, certainly, if we know a, a bear can smell the toppings on the pizza we had last night that's in our garbage can uh, from a mile away, that's, that's enough for us, right? That's pretty incredible. Um, to give you some kind of different perspective on that, their sense of smell is seven times better than a bloodhound, which makes it over 100 times better than our sense of smell. And the reason they can do that is inside their nasal cavities, they have a whole bunch of channels in there that increase the surface area for scent particles to stick. So they can process these smells much more efficiently than we can as humans or even as a bloodhound can. Lastly, I wanna to touch on their homing instinct. Um, so they sort of have this internal GPS where they know exactly where home is and if you take them away from home, they wanna come right back to it. Uh, so for this reason, we do not relocate bears in North Carolina. Uh, a, we have nowhere to put them. There's not already a dominant bear or it's inhabited by humans. Um, but also because of this homing instinct. When they make a beeline right back to where they came from, oftentimes they get hit by cars, um, they get shot in someone's yard who's not very tolerant of bears, or they encounter a more dominant bear. Uh, so for that high mortality rate, uh, we do not relocate bears in North Carolina. They are known as habitat generalists. Um, I really kind of liken them to white-tailed deer. Uh, so we used to think that bears needed these big expanses of woodlands to survive, but it turns out they're more than happy to live right here in our neighborhood. Um, so you will quite frequently around our area uh, see bears walking through the backyard, walking through downtown Asheville even, um, as you can see down here. So it's becoming more and more common to see them in these more developed areas. And the reason because the reason for that is because of the amount of resources available to them. So you see in their home range, they need that food, shelter, and places to travel to be able to uh, hook up with breeding females or males, depending on their uh, sex. So because of that, these 10 square, miles, 10 square kilometer uh, home range is more common in urban bears because there's a higher density of resources available to them. Things like bird feeders, garbage, pet food, you name it. Um, that 250 kilometer squared is more so for a rural bear, as we call them, uh, so for a more wild bear, so to speak. And they use these big expanses of land that encompass many different territories, if it, especially if it's a male, um, so that he can meet up for dates in the summertime. When it comes to breeding and denning, uh, really their breeding season is right, right now. So you might see a lot of activity recently, a lot of bears getting hit by vehicles recently as they're moving around. Um, looking to pair up for the uh, summer for breeding season. Um, they're really going to peak right now in the first two weeks of July. That's the peak for breeding and they're going to be reproducing every two years. So the cubs will stay with mom for about a year and a half. So in that second summer uh, is when they usually part ways and she will then come into estrus again um, and mate with a new bear that summer. Uh, so they'll be giving birth inside their dens from uh, January into early February. And uh, they'll again leave in the springtime, usually around uh, late April is when they'll emerge with those new cubs. When they're in their dens, usually that goes from somewhere in November to somewhere in March. Again, maybe a little bit later for those females who uh, just had cubs that in their den that year. Um, but during that time, their body temperature drops significantly, their heart rate decreases significantly as well. 
Um, usually it's around the same as our heart rate, maybe a little bit higher. Um, and we refer to this as torpor. It's not a true hibernation. And that's because of our climate here. Uh, we have such a temperate climate that these bears don't need to be unconscious in a cave for months on end. Uh, in the middle of January, you will definitely see a bear walking through your backyard looking for whatever it can get its hands on. Um, so it's not a true hibernation here in the southeast. I get this question a lot. Um, it's what, what do I do if I see a bear? And it kind of depends on the scenario here. Um, so if you're in the woods out hiking and you see a bear, obviously don't approach the bear. I give that bear a good amount of space. And if you can quietly move away from the area, back up and get out of the area, uh, that's the best option to go there. If you do come around the corner of a trail, come around the corner of your home, whatever the case may be, uh, and there's a bear right there, to so make sure that that bear can get away from you, make sure that you can get away from the bear. Um, make sure that you are also um, not closing any doors, windows, anything that allowed the bear to get into that area in the first place. So we see this often with bears inside homes. And a lot of people will say, well, that doesn't happen very often, does it? Well, it happens usually at least a couple times a week here in the Asheville area. We have bears inside people's homes because they left a door open, left a window open, um, or something uh, to that effect. And what I have to say there is make sure they have an escape route. And if you can back out the door, leaving the door open, uh, that's a great way to go there. Do not lock the bear in your kitchen or bathroom or whatever space. Um, your wallet will thank you in the long run and the bear will be much safer, you will be much safer if you just give it an escape route there. If the bear is just coming through your backyard, um, I know it's awfully tempting to, you know, watch the bears as they get into a bird feeder, watch the bears as they play in the hot tub or whatever the case may be. But when they're in our spaces and they're too comfortable, that's when we see a conflict arise between humans and bears. So when they're in our backyard, from a safe distance, make as loud, crazy noises as you possibly can, whether that's banging pots and pans together, spraying it with a garden hose, getting an air horn, whatever you can do that's big and crazy, uh, definitely use that opportunity to make that bear feel uncomfortable in your backyard. Um, that's gonna be best for the bear and best for your community, uh, both ends of that spectrum. So uh, again, air horn, pots and pans, um, yelling, whatever you can do to be loud and crazy to get that bear out of the area. Once it does leave, make sure that you figure out why it was there in the first place. Was it there for your bird feeder? Was it there for your cat food? Um, what was it trying to get to? What, what brought it to your home in the first place? Um, and again, also let your neighbors know as well so that they can remove whatever is attracting the bear to, the, your, uh, to your community. Um, letting neighbors know is really important because sometimes one person is experiencing issues that can be prevented by another neighbor, um, but when there's no communication, you kind of see the problems get bigger and bigger over time. Um, additionally, if you have a dog and you encounter a bear with your dog, um, always make sure your dog is on a leash, particularly during those crepuscular hours, so from dusk in, in the dawn hours. Um, that's when the bears are most likely to be around, and so having control of your dog is essential. So I'm going to show you a video here of what to do with a bear in your backyard. In this case, the bear is coming up on the back porch. Um, you'll see some bird feeders, a grill, several different attractants. And the woman here comes around the corner, sees the bear. She does not approach the bear, but she acts big and crazy to try to get the bear to leave the area. So you see, she yelled, she waved her arms around, and that bear reacted exactly as it should. So this is a scenario that we like to see happen. Uh, when a bear gets a little too bold and comes up on your porch, you make it uncomfortable, make it leave the area. Now this is a situation where a bear does not have an effective escape route. Uh, so this is actually in downtown Asheville in the Fine Arts District. And you'll see there's a wall of tourists on one side, a wall of cars on another side, a regular wall on the other side. Uh, so this bear felt the only escape route was to go up. And if you notice through the windows in that fence, there's also people up there. So this bear had no escape routes and it's a very dangerous situation to be in with a bear uh, that is cornered like this. Oh 
So again, if the bear is inside your home, uh, you encounter it in, you know, coming around the corner, whatever the case may be, make sure it has an escape route. So here's a situation where uh, ultimately we end up in when we don't set boundaries for bears in our yard. Um, eventually that yelling and screaming that we do to scare off the bear doesn't work. So this bear has accessed a pile of corn inside the garage and has also opened up the car door. Uh, so he is now defending this resource that he's found. He's defending this corn pile. Uh, so in this case, harassment is no longer working. So it's important to change up the way that you're harassing these bears. So don't always yell at them. Maybe you yell at them one time. Maybe you bang pots and pans another time. Maybe you use the horn the other time. Uh, so switching it up avoids this sort of situation where they get used to a person clapping and yelling and nothing bad really actually happens. So you can see the bear is bluff charging the woman, um, again guarding that resource, popping his jaws at her, uh, so these are all defensive behaviors of the bear saying, hey, get out of my space. So let's now that we have an idea of what's normal, what's not normal, um, how these senses are affecting these bears' behavior, let's talk about how to coexist with black bears in our communities. So in uh, southeastern U.S., we have about 70,000 black bears. That is an estimate. Um, but as you can see, North Carolina has the largest population of black bears in the southeastern U.S. Um, additionally, our black bear population is split into two separate groups, one in the mountains, one on the coast. And, um, you know, we see along the, um, the Smoky Mountains, I couldn't think of the word, uh, along the Smoky Mountains and up into kind of the northern part of the country, a uh, significant black bear population that's a significant part of their uh, range. So if we're looking at just North Carolina, uh, again, we can separate our bear population into two parts, uh, one part in the mountains, one part on the coast. Not many bears established in the Piedmont, so there's not a true population of bears in the Piedmont, that central region. Um, that's not to say that there aren't frequently bears passing through the Piedmont, uh, particularly younger bears, and we hope to keep it in these two distinct populations. The reason why is because of all of this orange and red you see on this map here. Um, so the red indicates the amount of uh, projected development, human development, by the year 2030. So you see lots of development in the Piedmont, lots of development in the mountains as well. Not quite as much on the coast, um, but you'll also notice that there's a larger population of bears on the coast. And that's part of that is because of the human population being more sparse, um, not too many uh, city centers throughout the coast. Um, but additionally, there's more temperate climate there, so it stays a little bit warmer year round. Uh, so that means longer growing seasons for a lot of their food resources. Um, it's available, you know, throughout the year versus in chunks or seasons of the year. Um, additionally, a lot of swampland, marshland, which is great habitat for bears as well. Um, so you can see here, we want to keep our populations where they're at. We don't want our populations to expand into the Piedmont. Um, and we want to see, uh, you know, a lot of coexistence going on, particularly in the mountains because of that level of projected development. If you look here, you can see um, you're probably in district either an eight or nine. So if you locate your county, you can find your district. Um, out here in Western North Carolina, uh, we have a lot of complaints. So I have it broken down here uh, by district. And so Buncombe County, for example, is in district nine. Uh, and we get regularly uh, a third to a half of the complaints for the entire state year round. Um, so in 2018, I kind of had two comparisons here because in 2018, we had a mass failure. So acorns and berries failed. And so we had a much higher uh, reporting rate for black bears than we did compared to last year when we had sort of a normal uh, mass year. If we break this down a little bit more uh, for Buncombe County, uh, Buncombe County, it's again, about a third of the calls for the entire state of North Carolina uh, each year. Again, 2018, we had mass failure and we had nearly two thirds of the calls for black bears throughout the state coming from Buncombe County. It's a big hot spot for us. Um, it's a big tour tourism uh, hot spot as well. So we have a population that we're trying to educate to coexist with bears that's changing essentially day to day as people come in and leave. Uh, another issue that we have is so many people are retiring here and they're retiring from areas where they haven't had to deal with black bears before. They haven't had to coexist with bears um, 
And so they come in and they get a, a, rude, a rude awakening, a wake up call, so to speak. And so we get a lot of calls where people just need to know where to start when it comes to coexisting with black bears. So that's kind of why we see these high numbers coming out of Buncombe County. So with all these complaints that we're getting, specifically here in Western North Carolina, there's a significant need for a program like BearWise. BearWise is a regional program in the southeastern U.S. And what it does is it shares ways to prevent conflicts from happening in the first place and then give you a wide variety of tools to use to um, remedy the conflicts that you're already experiencing. Uh, so for this, it, you know, it, we kind of give you a toolbox and we say which tools are going to work best for you and you can pick and choose what works, works best in your community. Um, we want to also encourage people to um, make their own initiatives to keep bears wild, whether that's coming together as a community, as a book club, whatever, you know, community organization comes together to advocate for bears and coexisting with black bears. We have a great website here, bearwise.org. And that, again, services the entire southeastern region. Um, but in North Carolina, we reference this website a lot because it's a, a one-stop shop, essentially, for anything black bear related. Any sort of scenario you're experiencing, it's very likely on that website. Um, it, it, it really serves to give us some continuity among the southeastern states. So if you have a mountain house in North Carolina and you have a beach house down in Florida, uh, you know, you're having to coexist with bears in each, around each home. Uh, we want you to have the same message no matter where you're at so you know exactly what to do, uh, whether you're vacationing in the mountains or vacationing at the beach. So here we have the six Bearwise basics, and this is really the foundation of Bearwise. Following these six Bearwise basics really helps to, um, you know, keep bears wild, keep bears safe. And they're really pretty simple things to implement around our homes. So let's dive right into these. Number one is never feed or approach bears. Um, this one's kind of a duh sort of thing, but uh, never walk up to a bear, never try to feed a bear to get it to walk up to you. Um, these are unfortunately situations we see a lot with our tourists, but also with people who are just way too friendly with bears, uh, particularly in Buncombe County and Asheville area. Um, really, when it comes to feeding bears, it breaks down to uh, intentional versus non-intentional feeding. So what that means is are you intentionally putting out corn to feed bears or are you putting out a bird feeder intending to feed finches but the bears are eating the bird seed. Um, so there's two separate categories there. If you see anyone intentionally feeding bears, intentionally attracting the bears to their property, we definitely want to know about that. Um, it is illegal in the state of North Carolina to feed bears processed foods. So we're talking things like uh, donuts, um, cookies, steak, you know, all the crazy things that people feed bears off their back porch. Um, when it comes to something like a corn pile, however, unprocessed foods, that's not illegal, but it can still be a significant uh, public safety issue. So we definitely want to know about that as well. Uh, so reporting that to NC Wildlife is essential so that we can put a stop to that early before it becomes a safety issue. There, there are also a lot of potential hidden sources of feeding around your home. I encourage everyone to take a walk around your home, um, you know, if you've got a nice sunny day this weekend, and just kind of look at what may potentially attract bears in the future. Maybe it's not an issue yet, but it could be uh, if a bear were to come along and discover it. So I encourage everyone to look for those hidden sources of unintentional feeding. When it comes to securing food, garbage, and recycling, this is a big one. Um, a bear's strongest sense, remember, is their sense of smell. They can smell seven times better than a bloodhound. So they can smell those Tic Tacs that you have sitting in your, uh, your cup holder in your seat of your car uh, over a mile away. So because of this, it's really important to secure our human foods. Um, so if you're eating on the back porch, that's perfectly fine, but don't walk inside for five minutes to answer the phone and not expect to see a bear on your back porch. It's completely possible. Um, they're very much driven by their sense of smell, and if you're not around to guard that food, um, they may take advantage of that. Same thing if you are bringing groceries from your car. Um, it's important to realize you can't leave that hatch open, you can't leave it unlocked, uh, because the bear will come up and swipe a week's worth of groceries in two seconds flat. Um, also important, never to leave food in your vehicle. Again, something as small as Tic Tacs or a pack of gum can attract a bear to your vehicle. If it is unlocked or a window is open, um, the bear can very easily get into your vehicle. I tell people, uh, trust your neighbors, but don't trust the bears, and here's why. They can open the car doors like it's nothing. Um, it's very easy for them, especially once they figure it out once or twice, they can even start targeting vehicles to see if they're unlocked. 
Another potential hazard is if this car door closed behind the bear. That's often when we see vehicles totaled. Um, and it does happen, and it does happen rather frequently around Western North Carolina, where a bear gets trapped inside a car, panics, and just tears the car apart. Um, so definitely get in the habit of locking your doors, closing your windows at all times. Again, trust your neighbors, don't trust the bears. Uh, when it comes to garbage recycling, this is a big one for us. Uh, if you're on a collection service, the best thing you can do is put your garbage cart at the curb the morning of collection. So um, usually after 6 or 7 a.m. But if you can wait and get it out as close to your pickup time as possible, that's even better. Uh, we want to shorten that window of time that a bear can access that garbage can. Uh, in non-collection days or if you are somebody who uses uh, the dump that takes your trash to the dump, Make sure that you're storing your garbage cart in a bear resistant location, a locking shed, a garage that you keep the door closed at all times. Even if you're out mowing the grass, close the garage door. Um, and that can really help to secure your garbage. Other things like freezing any food scraps before you put them in your garbage can help as well. You know, freeze them and then wait till you take it to the dump or you have a collection day to put it out in the cart. Um, can all be super helpful. You'll hear some sort of myths about putting ammonia, gasoline, um, kitty litter. I, we've heard it all at this point. Uh, no, no scent deterrent has been proven to um, prevent a bear from accessing your garbage can or deter a bear from accessing your garbage can. So I really encourage you not to do that. Some of those chemicals can actually blind a bear. Um, and when you mix some chemicals with other chemicals that people are using, you can get some pretty nasty combinations that aren't good for the sanitation workers as well. Uh, so highly recommend that you look at securing your garbage can versus using a scent deterrent. So there are bear, bear resistant containers available. Um, if you are in Buncombe County on Waste Pro service, so county service, um, they do have an option that's the Cadillac of garbage cans, automatic locking, um, it, when you have it at the curb, it can stay locked. That'll run you either $300 if you want to purchase or about 10 bucks a month. Um, so that's fairly reasonable for most people um, if you can go for that option. But I recognize that some of these bear resistant options can be pretty cost prohibitive for the average Joe. Uh, so if you're trying to purchase one outright, it can be anywhere from $100 to $300. So there are, uh, a, there are sort of DIY plans where you can retrofit your cart. As you can see in the picture on here, uh, we have some metal clasps, so you have to secure that lid, or uh, reinforce that lid if you can. Something like a bungee cord or a ratchet strap, strap is just not gonna cut it for these bears. Um, there's also bear resistant dumpsters. If you're in a community that has a dumpster, you can look into purchasing a bear resistant option that can be very effective. Uh, but regardless, if you're putting your trash out, um, put it out after 6 a.m. the morning of pickup. Uh, a good bear resistant garbage cart, whether it's a commercial cart or it's retrofitted, should behave like this cart. The bear can flip it around, um, bite it, claw at it, but it can't access that reward on the inside. Um, so this is a bear that's been visiting this garbage can for quite some time. All of a sudden it's locked and he's going to try to open it. Eventually he'll move on. Um, he'll probably come back and check just a few more times to make sure it's still locked. Um, and then eventually after maybe a couple weeks, he'll move on and stop returning to check on this garbage can. So number three is bird feeders. This is another big one for us. Um, we have to remember that bears are all about easy calories and they're following their nose. So the average bird feeder, for example, um, if it holds about five to seven pounds of bird seed, and we're talking your kind of classic black sunflower seed mix, uh, that's about 20,000 calories for a bear. For reference, during the springtime, spring and summer, they're, in, they're trying to consume anywhere from uh, two to 5,000 calories per day to meet their caloric intake uh, requirements. During the fall, they enter hyperphagia, where they're packing on the pounds to get ready for the winter months when food is scarce. During that time, they're consuming 20,000 calories per day. So one of these bird feeders is the equivalent of one day's worth of calories in the fall or multiple days worth of calories in the spring and summer. Uh, so keep that in mind when you have these resources out there. This could be why the bears are coming in and tearing up your bird feeders. Um, we highly recommend that you don't feed birds through a bird feeder. Um, instead, we'd like to see the use of pollinator gardens. Um, there's a lot of other options out there. Audubon Society has some great resources for native species of plants that you can plant in your yard um, specific to your zip code. 
and it'll bring in a wider diversity of birds and a higher quantity of birds as well. Um, in addition to just being much more healthier resource for the birds, uh, things like millets and suet and things that we hang in our backyards aren't necessarily natural food resources for the birds we're trying to see. So consider some other options. Um, if you have to have a bird feeder out, we ask that you take it in um, from March to November. Um, because that's when the bears are most active. That's when they're most likely to hit up these bird feeders. Although remember, they're going through torpor in the winter, so not a true hibernation. They may still come out in the winter and come to your bird feeder. Um, at that time, make sure that you bring it in for a couple weeks until that bear moves on. There are no practical bear resistant bird eaters. Um, you may see some options out there. They're gonna require steel poles, concrete, um, you know, rigging of bird feeders, all kinds of different crazy scenarios none of which are very pretty, if you ask me in my personal opinion, um, but they're also gonna be pretty expensive as well. So you have to also consider that even if you rig up your bird feeder, you know, as you can see here, rig it up through some, um, some line between trees, or if you put it up on your second, third story balcony, these bears can still access the feeder itself, but consider the spillage that falls when these bears are accessing uh, when these, uh, you know, birds, squirrels, whatever, are accessing the bird seed, it falls on the ground. That can be more of a attractant sometimes than the feeder itself. So consider these sorts of things. Check out Audubon Society's planting list for native species. It can be a huge benefit for birds. So as I said, garbage and bird feeders are a big two. And here's a perfect example, uh, an unfortunate example of how this can play out in the community. So in these fall of 2018, we had an incident where a neighbor moved in the across the street from Miss Tony here, and the neighbors had, uh, they, they would put the garbage out the night before collection. Additionally, there were bird feeders in the area. Other people weren't securing their garbage. There was a myriad of things going on that were not bear wise. Uh, unfortunately, there was a female bear with cubs and she had become food conditioned, food conditioned to the point where she was guarding these resources. Uh, so Ms. Tony here took her dog out on a leash at night uh, with a flashlight. She checked the yard first, but the bears were on the other side of her vehicle. Um, so they, she didn't see them coming around the vehicle until they were head on. Um, unfortunately, the yippy dog, as I call them, um, that Miss Tony had uh, was barking at the bear and the bear pursued the dog. Miss Tony picked up the dog, started busting it to the house, and unfortunately, uh, the bear pursued Miss Tony all the way to her front door. So very, very escalated bear behavior, not normal by any standard, even though she had cubs. Um, she should have, once Miss Tony left the area, she should have stopped and continued on with her cubs, but she did not. So because of that behavior, the female bear had to be euthanized and the cubs were of an age where they could be relocated to be on their own. So we took them just outside the community. Um, and so far the cubs have been successful, but this whole scenario just goes to show that unsecured trash and bird feeders can create a situation like this. They have created a situation like this. Uh, so something to consider when you're making decisions around your home, you're also making these decisions for your neighbors as well. Miss Tony was doing everything right on her property. She didn't have any tractants on her property, but her neighbors did. And she ended up paying the price for that. So I always put that out there as something to consider, something to chew on when you're making these sorts of uh, decisions. Number four is never leave pet food outdoors. Um, this tends to happen with cats or with small livestock. Um, that seed that's out there or that cat food that's on the porch draws in the bears. Uh, so make sure that you are securing your food. So those big bags of feed um, in a garage, inside, uh, wherever you can get it that's bear resistant, that's locked away from bears. Um, again, any leftover pet food from your, your dog, cat, livestock, um, make sure you try to get that indoors if you can. Uh, once the, the animal is done feeding. And electric fencing can be great, particularly with small livestock because you can't pick up every seed where the chickens missed. Um, so fencing off beehives, uh, any sort of small livestock with the electric fencing can be very effective. There are some great DIY options on bearwise.org where it has it listed out for you cookbook style um, of how to install electric fencing properly for black bears. As you can see down there, a regular fence is not going to keep a black bear out. So keep that in mind. Number five is clean and store grills. Um, this is something that often gets overlooked, but be mindful that when you lift up that lid, you smell the hamburgers from last week. And for us, it smells delicious. For the bears, it smells equally delicious. Um, so if you haven't ever had a, an issue with your grill, awesome, go play the lottery. Um, but if you have had an issue with the grill, you know how much of a pain it can be. 
Uh, so make sure that you are cleaning that grill after every use. Crank up that heat, scrape down all the bits and pieces, and then something that's often forgotten is the drip tray. Pull out the drip tray, and if you can clean it out or if you can dispose of it, um, that's gonna be great. You can even stick it in the freezer, freeze it until collection day or your next dump run. Um, and then cover it and store it in a bear resistant location, a garage, shed, um, if you can strap it down in some way, however you can secure that grill best uh, in your specific scenario. Last but not least is again, let your neighbors know about bear activity. Resources like the Nextdoor website, Facebook groups um, can all be great. Simple word of mouth as you see somebody walking down the street and you just saw a bear at the end of the road, let them know so they can change their, their route to walk their dog. Um, additionally, in BearWise certified communities, where uh, a community has come together to initiate the six BearWise basics, they have a liaison, and that liaison is intended to collect reports of bear activity and let the neighbor, neighbors know what's going on in the community. Um, so I add that one in there as well. I say all this um, to say don't give a traveling bear an excuse to stick around. Most of the time, bears are just moving through our yard, um, but we're giving them reasons to stick around because of the pet food, garbage, bird feeders, you name it. Um, so when they are sticking around our homes, they're more likely to be hit by cars. Um, that's the number one source of mortality outside of hunting in the state of North Carolina, is vehicle strikes. Um, in fact, I was driving down Hendersonville Road, let's see, that was Monday around lunchtime, so around noon, and a bear got hit in the middle of the, in the, middle of the road. That was just the other day. So um, be mindful of that. Here's another scenario is these, these bears get bold and they come up onto your porch, they start playing with your door handles, specifically those paddle style door handles. And this is the epitome of severe bear behavior. In these scenarios, this is when we tend to see bears get shot by the homeowner. State law, not NC wildlife regulation, but state law says that you can shoot a bear if it is actively causing property damage or actively impacting human safety. So in this case, this bear is doing both. He's damaging the door and he's impacting their safety by trying to break into the home. So in these sorts of cases, um, you know, that's where the bird feeders and the um, trash and everything leads to eventually is the bear coming up onto your porch, pushing on windows, pushing on doors, and eventually it will get inside one house. Um, and so that's why I said be shot legally or illegally. Um, they also may have to be removed by an agency. So we've only had to remove two bears um, since 2007 when our, our current state bear biologist came in and implemented her regulations. Um, so we really opt for education. In District 9, where I'm located in Montgomery County and out to the Tennessee line, uh, we've never had to uh, euthanize a bear. We've never been in that situation before. We would like to keep it that way. Um, so make sure that you are taking these, these tips seriously. You're letting your neighbors know about all of this information so that we can keep bears wild, keep people safe. So let's wrap it up here with a little bit of research. So there's the urban suburban black bear study going on in Asheville city limits. Um, this is actually phase two of the study. Phase one was looking at general bear movements and bear populations in Asheville. Phase two is looking at more, what are these bears feeding on? What are they using for resources in Asheville city limits? How are they denning um, around the Asheville area? Uh, how many cubs are they having? Um, and looking at the composition of their diet, it, what is natural versus what is human um, resources in terms of their diet. Another effector that we're looking at is bear wise certified communities. How are those certified communities affecting the behavior of the bears? Are they working essentially? How are they impacting, um, sorry, how are they impacting uh, the movements of bears? How are they impacting the way people perceive bears? Um, and sort of everything in between here. So you see our big culvert traps. We put the collars on the bear, so you may see collars around, um, collared bears around, and those bears provide us essential data of what our urban bears are doing. How are they comparing to our rural bears? Uh, so we hope to have some results in June 2023 with COVID and all the restrictions that came into play this year. Um, that may get pushed back a little bit, but we hope to stay on track there with that. So at this time, I wanna open up for questions. So I'm gonna look through that Q&A section, um, but do take a look at this information that's up here. Not only is my information up here, but there's also the NC Wildlife Helpline. That's a great resource for any wildlife issues you are experiencing. Go ahead and give them a call, send them an email, um, and then you can get your wildlife, uh, any sort of wildlife questions answered very quickly. Uh, there's also the Wildlife Enforcement Division down there, so you can go to that site, type in your county and your district, 
and pull up an officer that's located in your county if you need that uh, more uh, emergency type help there. All right, Ashley, thank you. Wonderful presentation. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. And so on all your information. So, so I'll leave this up for five more seconds. Yes. But it'll be recorded, so you can always go back. Thank you. Uh, and, and questions. So num number one, uh, can a male bear recognize if uh, their offsprings are theirs? and would they kill offspring uh, cubs that are not there? Yes, so not super clear on how they can identify, um, it's referred to as kinship, um, but they typically can, and that's sort of, um, you know, throughout the animal kingdom, we see this with various species, uh, but they will protect their own cubs, they will leave them alone, but they will um, go after the cubs of females that had, uh, you know, cubs sired by another male. And so they do that in order to let that female come back into estrus so that they can meet with her. Great. Um, we had someone who said that they designed a bear proof uh, way to keep the bear from climbing up 15 feet to their deck. And he said no, he had a lot of problems before this design and installation and none since. Uh, can he send you a photo of his design so that you could publish it somewhere? Uh, sure, we'll, we'd be happy to take a look at it, yeah. Great. Um, my neighbor insists on doing bird feeding, um, but she's had several encounters with moms and, and cubs. Um, I've spoken to her over and over again. Do you have any suggestions? So if it's bird feeders that are the issue, and if it's causing property damage for you, or if it's a public safety issue for you, um, definitely you can contact a wildlife conservation officer and they may be able to pay a visit to your neighbor just to kind of explain what's going on, why this doesn't benefit bears or birds, um, and, and try to have a calm conversation with them. Usually that works when you have that badge out there. So if you are experiencing one of those things, go ahead and contact uh, one of the officers. Okay, do bears have a good memory? Will they keep going back and back and back to where there has been garbage, uh, or will they remember if they had had <clears throat> a very aggressive encounter with a human at one point? Yeah, so they, I often say, you know, the phrase is elephants never forget, but really black bears never forget. Um, so they recognize where they can find a patch of acorns from year to year. Uh, they recognize which house has the bird feeders out, which house puts their trash out before, you know, the night before. They, they know all these things, they pick up on these things, and they make a routine out of it. Um, so yes, very much they have great memories. And if they had an aggressive encounter with a human, would that uh, cause them to become aggressive? So not necessarily aggressive. Uh, black bears are very shy, especially compared to their cousins, the grizzly bears. So uh, usually when they're hazed by, bear, by, sorry, hazed by people enough, um, they start to associate people with being uncomfortable. So they tend to avoid people, people places, people things, which is why I highly recommend the pots and pans, the water hose, the air horns, and all, all the various harassment techniques. Um, how effective are hot bird seeds? So hot bird seed is really just seasoning the bird seed for the bear. Um, you're making it a little bit more tasty for them. The capsaicin levels in something like cayenne pepper isn't to the level of something like a bear spray. So it's just not, it doesn't have enough kick to it to be able to deter the bear. And we just were noticed, uh, notified that Asheville has just sent out a black bear alert. What does that mean? Yes, so that was me. That was the first time we've sent out one of these alerts. I believe it came out around seven o'clock. So if you are located within Asheville city limits and you didn't receive that alert, um, look into signing up for Ash, I think it's called AVL alerts. Um, but essentially what we have done is with the 4th of July weekend coming up, there's gonna be a lot of food around people's houses, a lot more trash around, um, a lot more potential for food to be left outside overnight. Um, so we just wanted to give people resources to uh, really handle situations if they are in, having an encounter with a bear around their community. If uh, there's a mom uh, with her cubs, do, do you still recommend that we make loud noises? My experience was that the mother bear charged me in order to try to protect her, her, clubs, uh, her cubs when I tried to shoo her away from, from my area. 
Yeah, so that was that's kind of where I emphasize doing this from a safe distance. So on that little uh, chart, I guess you could call it the graphics. Um, so I do this from a safe distance. You don't want to do this, you know, walking up to the bear or anything like that. So if you can get a safe distance and then shoo her away, um, that can be quite effective. If you find that she's just not leaving, go ahead and go back inside, back up the way you came, go back inside, and uh, you can give us a call on that helpline number and report that activity um, or that encounter. We have an apple orchard um, and it's been a bear favorite for three years. They break the branches and they even one dropped out of the tree at 11 in the morning while I was gardening. Do you have any advice for me? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, recognizing that there is a state law for property damage, um, you know, not everybody likes to take lethal action against a bear, but that is a right that we have under state law. Um, additionally, maybe looking into electric fencing. I'm not sure what the setup is there. Um, but electric fencing can be very effective in keeping bears out of wherever we want them to stay out. Um, and then hazing the bears as much as possible. So um, you can try some uh, automatic floodlights, the motion detection floodlights. Same thing, there's motion detector sprinkles, sprinklers as well. Um, there's a couple different techniques there that you could try out. Bearwise.org has some good options there for agriculture as well, agricultural setups um, that you can check out. Um, if one is walking down a city street and a bear actually is approaching uh, to, to me and there's no way out, there's no driveway, um, what do you recommend? Yeah, that's when you're going to have to get big and crazy, as big and crazy as you can. You can throw rocks and branches and whatever you can do um, and just make sure that the bear can get out as well. Um, some other things that I mentioned that you can carry with you um, if you feel confident enough to is, is bear spray. You know, you can hook it on your belt loop as you're going out for a walk. If that makes you feel safe and you know how to use it, um, then that's certainly an option to have kind of in your back pocket almost literally. Um, a bear bent uh, a metal pole with a birdhouse on top that had a chickadee nest in it. So the question is, should we not put bear houses out as well as bird feeders? So bird, bird houses tend to be much less of an attractant, but certainly if there's something else attracting the bear to the area and they pick up on that nest, they will definitely check it out. Um, they follow their nose. So I wouldn't say that bird houses are as much of an attractant as a bird feeder. Um, but if you're experiencing repeated, uh, you know, visits by the bear where he's tearing down those bird houses, then definitely I would consider bringing those in. Where does one report aggressive bears? I think you already answered this. Exactly. That um, wildlife helpline, you can email or call. And uh, will a vegetable garden attract bears? Yeah, with vegetable gardens, it can be a bit of hit or miss. If you have something like blueberries or blackberries growing in your garden, um, certainly that can be an attractant. When it comes to things like tomatoes and carrots, um, some bears love them, some bears will, will be indifferent to them. Um, if you are experiencing damage or if you wanna get in front of it, um, you wanna prevent anything from happening in the future, again, electric fencing can be great. And there's a specific way to space the, the wires for that electric fencing. So bearwise.org has, again, that kind of cookbook version of how to set that up. Um, that can be a really great resource for you. Are there resident bears in West Asheville neighborhoods? Yes, so we definitely have resident bears in Asheville. Um, phase one of the urban suburban bear study showed us that we do have resident bears. So in other words, we have bears who are uh, living year round within Asheville city limits. They don't really need to go outside of Asheville to get the resources that they need. Um, but the number of resident bears is a little bit hard to, to peg down. Um, some people you know, we'll estimate at a couple hundred, some say 50, um, but as a biologist, it's very hard to peg down a certain number. There certainly are resident bears though. Uh, there's a growing group of people in Buncombe that believe many bears are being trapped to cut their paws off. The population of three-legged bears, can you talk about this? Yeah, so actually our Wildlife Enforcement Division has looked into this, our local division um, here in Western North Carolina. They've put in over a thousand man hours um, into looking at every lead that's been provided. Um, they follow them to the end to the fullest extent that legally you're able to go. Um, and nothing has shown any sort of evidence of any trapping going on um, or any harm to the animals, which is why we think it's much more likely that these animals are getting harmed 
by vehicle collisions, because again, that's the number one source of mortality for bears outside of hunting season. Um, additionally, things like dumpster diving, you know, they can get things wrapped around their limbs, they can get injuries impaled that way, um, you know, and, and generally fighting with each other, falling out of trees, you know, they're, they're pretty rough animals. So uh, we think one of those options is much more likely to explain what's going on. Are whistles useful on the trail? Yeah, whistles, bear bells, um, again, those little air horns, you can get kind of a mini version that can be great. Um, really, the idea there is just to make noise. I know some ladies that have a, a little walking group around their neighborhood and they carry rocks in a can and that works for them. So uh, however you can make noise. We have a screened in porch on our second level of our home. Have you ever heard of a bear breaking through the screened in porch to get into the second level? Absolutely. Um, screen is not going to hold back a bear, whether it's at a window, um, screen and porch, whether you have a screen door, um, they almost lean on it and accidentally break through it. You know, they're so big, so heavy, they have those claws. Um, so definitely do not rely on a screen for keeping out a bear, no matter if it's, again, window, door, screen and porch. Um, the best thing you can do to prevent a bear from coming onto your porch is to A, harass the bear when it's around, make it feel uncomfortable around your home, B, move a lot of the resources. Um, you know, if you have pet food sitting out there, if you keep your bird seat up there, um, your grill is up there, make sure that you're taking steps to secure the attractants on your porch. What, if anything, is being done for keeping the bear population at safe levels? Yeah, so our kind of ideal situation for our population to be in is um, at 0% growth. So that would indicate a stable population. Um, right now, we're at somewhere around 1% to 2% growth, and we're declining. So we're quickly reaching that 0% growth level, and that's where we want to be at. That's that sweet spot. Um, so beyond that, we're using hunting as a technique. We use a sanctuary system as well to protect females and their cubs. Um, and then we promote things like bearwise to keep those unnatural resources inside. Um, and it just really, it, it's, it's tough when the population is increased so much. It's in the 70s, we had about 300 bears. Now we have 20,000 bears. So in just a few decades, our population has grown that much. Um, and so it's, it definitely seems like there's being a bigger impact in, in addition to our growing human population as well. Would a barking dog scare off a bear or cause it to charge? Yeah, so most of the time when we see a human hurt by a bear, it's because that bear has um, gone after the dog. So bears and dogs don't mix. Um, even if you have a big, tough dog, maybe you even have a plot hound that's born and raised to you know, go after bears. Um, do not let your dog go after a bear. Uh, what tends to happen is that bear reaches a certain limit where it decides to turn around and defend itself. And that's where your dog gets injured. Um, so don't allow your dog to chase the bears. Um, there's a YouTube channel that features a group of bears <clears throat> that the homeowner is allowing to approach him as he sits on the porch. Very, very dangerous. Who should we report to about this YouTube channel? Yeah, so you can report things like that um, to the helpline. Again, kind of a one-stop shop there, that helpline. We can get information to the most pertinent uh, person in the commission. Uh, we are aware of a couple different um, situations where we can't identify where it's actually happening, um, but we're aware we monitor a few situations. So um, we're definitely welcome to more reports. So uh, like I said, it can become a public safety issue very quickly. Do you wanna repeat what that helpline is or what that is? Right, so the Wildlife Helpline phone number is 866-318-2401. And currently with COVID-19, that's staffed from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. Uh, so you can call between those hours during uh, the work week and leave a message for us. We'll get that message to the right person to get in contact with you to help you with your issue. Additionally, you can email us um, if you have something like pictures you wanna send along with your report. Um, that uh, email address is hwi at ncwildlife.org. Do, do you have that on a slide somewhere that you can? Uh, I do. Uh, okay, at the end, hopefully we'll, we'll put that up. Sure. What is the best way to, to deter a bear if you're approached while hiking and you're waving your hands and getting big and yelling, doesn't work. Yeah, so that's when it's great to have that air horn, bear spray, um, again, uh, throwing things at the bear, whatever you can do. Um, another great technique I've heard about is 
taking a garbage bag and rolling it up in your back pocket so when you pull it out you can fluff it so to speak like you're about to put it in the trash can um, so that visual mix with the sound can often deter a bear as well that's kind of a weird sound for them they have never heard before so that's also a good option uh, suggestions for composting so with composting it can be done um, make sure you're doing it in a bear resistant location um, also make sure that uh, sorry the brown layer on top of your green layers um, make that brown layer a little bit thicker um, and once you see a bear start accessing that pile, you really got to consider bringing it in. Um, the, the jig is up at that point. So you might consider bringing it in at that point. Um, Bearwise.org does have some um, guidance on how to compost in bear country as well. So if you look at the website, um, you can get, again, that cookbook uh, kind of DIY version. Um, I know Western North Carolina Nature Center has a couple of bears, but is there anywhere else one can see bears safely? So if you want to see bears safely, um, definitely just driving up and down the parkway. Uh, I hate to say it, but drive up and down Town Mountain Road. Um, you'll definitely likely come across a bear eventually. Um, there are also some bears at the uh, NC State Zoo. They have bears as well. So if you're looking for more of a, a confined situation. Um, but I, I saw one, I live down here by the airport and I saw one today just, just on a back road. So uh, they're around, keep, keep your eyes peeled and there's definitely some hot spots on the parkway in Town Mountain Road. Um, Angela Song just sent you the YouTube uh, that had these folks uh, attracting bears, but Angela, you need to actually send that uh, to uh, Ashley uh, after this is over and not just leave it on Q&A. Yeah, I'll have my email up at the end along with the helpline information. Great. Twice recently while working in my yard, a bear came up behind me, snorted, as though trying to announce her present. She was never aggressive. Was she warning me that she was there so I could move on? <laughs> yeah, so it was probably, again, sort of a defensive thing. Kind of, hey, you're a little close to me. Um, I need some space, sort of a message. And it's kind of funny that bears will approach a human, but then tell us to back off. Um, but, you know, they're big bears, so they can do that. So, yes, that's definitely a warning to give them more space. My bird feeder is up very high, and we've never had any bear activity for seven years. Is this still an enticing situation? Yeah, so part of BearWise's purpose is to let people be proactive, so to give people tools so they can avoid having issues. Um, the number of people I talk to every day that say, I've lived here for 10, 15, 30 years and never had a bear issue till today. Um, is, is pretty significant. So I'd say if you, um, you know, are apt to try some other ways to feed birds around your property, um, in addition to bringing down that bird feeder at least until somewhere around uh, Thanksgiving time, um, those would be your best options. Again, to be proactive because once we have the bears coming in, um, you know, they don't forget when they can access those resources. So it takes a while to unlearn that behavior in them. Is it recommended to throw things at bears to dissuade them from coming onto your property? Yeah, if you're um, unable to yell and clap your hands and all that good stuff and that's not working, um, then definitely pick up a rock. If you're unable to get yourself out of that situation, yelling and harassing them isn't working, picking up rocks, sticks, things like that um, can be a, a last resort. We have a lot of blackberries around our home. Is that dangerous and we should we cut them down? If you're able to remove them and you're seeing a lot of bear activity, um, I definitely suggest that. Uh, they can be a pretty big uh, attractant, specifically this time of year when they're starting to come uh, to, to ripen up. Uh, so you might consider removing them. Uh, if you can fence them off with electric fencing, that can be a great option as well. If you like to pick the berries and you, you, know, you use them for baking and things like that. Um, so either way, whichever is gonna work best for your scenario. If on a walk in the woods with dogs and we come across a bear, but it's blocking the way back to the car, do we try and scare it off? Yeah, so if you're at a reasonable enough distance, a safe distance, um, you can try harassing the, the, the bears. Um, even more safer if you can turn around and go back the other way down the trail and just kind of wait a little bit for the bear to move on. Uh, that can also be a good, a good option as well. You already talked about compost piles, but is there a way to keep them out and not have to give up your compost pile and move it back in? 
Yeah, looking at that literature on bearwise.org, um, that's going to help you in terms of how to place your layers of green and brown and um, different bear resistant options for securing that compost. But like I said, sometimes these bears, they just, they're so smart, so adamant, they follow their nose, they just figure it out. Um, so definitely give that a look uh, and see if you can make that work for you. My husband likes to camp in very remote areas. So what's his best protection? I definitely say bear spray. Um, it's better to have it and not need it than need it and not have it. Um, additionally, look up on, you know, bearwise.org has some great videos on there of how to use it. Um, you can also get some training cans, some, some cans that don't have the actual uh, capsaicin spray in them. So you can practice. Um, again, it's better to know what you're doing before using it. Um, you could also consider some of the uh, portable electric fencing that they use primarily out west, but if you really just wanted to take that extra step, um, that's also an option as well. If the bear is just right outside the window of your house, uh, should you be banging pots and pans inside the house or an air horn, or do you need to go outside to bang the pots and pans in the air horn? Yeah, so start banging on that window if you can. Obviously, don't break the window, but um, do your air horn, pots and pans, yelling, whatever you can do. And when that bear moves a safe distance away from the house, you know, if you can get out on the porch or just open the door and start doing it as well. Um, so don't be, be a little bit rel relentless with it, especially with that more escalated behavior of coming up onto a porch or looking in windows and things like that. You want to take that seriously and really get in front of that. Well, I guess this was a sequel to that question. So uh, if we're sleeping out, uh, if, if we're sleeping, I guess, in the house and wake up and the bear is smack on the porch, do we want to stay quiet? But I think you answered to no, yep. don't stay quiet. Get them out of there. Yep, don't let them come on your porch. We love them. They're awesome creatures. We love to see them around. Um, don't, don't give them the opportunity to come onto your porch because it only escalates from there. Does pepper spray work as well as bear spray for hiking? Yeah, so pepper spray doesn't spray as far as bear spray does. And additionally, the capsaicin level isn't high enough to deter a bear. So definitely go with bear spray. If you are in a pinch though, and all you have is pepper spray, you know, obviously I wouldn't, I wouldn't say not, don't use it. Um, but if you are intentionally wanting to carry something to deter bears, definitely go with the bear spray. Uh, does Waste Pro accept the, the DIY HASP trash can design shown in the Bearwise site? Yes, so I actually just talked to their director um, just a few days ago and I asked him that exact question and he clarified yes, that they will allow anyone to um, pursue a DIY option to secure your garbage can. The only thing is when you put it at the curb for collection, you have to make sure it's unlocked so that when the guys come up with the truck to dump it in uh, the, the back of the truck that it's already unlocked for them. Um, if you leave it locked, there is a high possibility that they will just skip over your garbage can. You've used the term safe distance. Uh, can you explain a little bit more what's safe? Yeah, so you might find that uh, what you feel to be a safe distance, the bear still thinks you need to back up some. They start popping their jaws or bluff charging a little bit more. Um, generally a good uh, 20 to 50 feet anywhere in there can, can be a safe distance. Um, and a, a couple of people have expressed concern that they still think bears are being tracked, uh, tra trapped for their paws. You, you feel like basically you all have disproven this, correct? Yeah, based on our law enforcement division's findings, um, you know, they put in, again, over a thousand man hours. That's, that's a lot of man hours for our small division. Um, so based on their findings, we don't think that anything was a serious um, lead, so to speak. And as new leads come in, they're continuing to, continuing to investigate to uh, the fullest extent that they can. Um, so keep in mind that you know, maybe what we hope to see as the outcome in terms of pursuing people who we think might be doing something, um, you know, you can't do that. Um, you can't do some things that they're asking for, if that makes sense. Um, so over a thousand man hours, nothing has come up. Um, they're continuing to accept any leads that come in and follow them to their fullest extent. Uh, last question, and you've gotten lots and lots of compliments of great information, great presentations. Thank you. Congratulations, Ashley. 
Last question. It sounds like maybe it's not a good idea to sleep with one's first floor window open, particularly a bedroom window. What do you think? Yeah, I refer you back to trust your neighbors, don't trust the bears. Um, definitely those windows, even if there's a screen on them, even if they're the kind that crank open just a little bit, uh, the bears will come through if there's something that, you know, again, they're following their nose. If there's something that smells good enough for them to come through the window, they certainly will. Um, so if there is able, if they're able to access that window, then definitely leave it closed. Well, one last, last question. Uh, when you're hiking, are you safer with a dog and does it depend if the dog is on a leash? Yeah, so it definitely depends if the dog is on a leash. Um, always have your dog on a leash. We live in bear country. Um, bears are in our backyard. Bears are out on the trails that we hike. Bears are where we camp. Um, having control of your dog is going to make you and your dog safer when it comes to encounters with bears. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that you're unsafe for having your, bear, your dog out there hiking, um, but just make sure that you have control over your dog. <clears throat> if you have a, you know, a Great Dane and you got it out on a trail and you know if it bolts off after a bear, even if it's on a leash um, and you can't control it, then don't take that animal out. Um, that's not going to be very safe. So use some common sense in there. Um, when it comes to your animals and just always, always, always have them secure. And are there bears in Leicester? Yes, 100%. <laughs> yes. And again, Ashley, thank you. Thank you so much. And are you going to put up your information on the last slide here? Yes, ma'am. Just one moment. There we go. So you have the helpline information, wildlife enforcement division information, and my information. If you're calling to report a, report a bear though, please refer to that helpline, um, not me. I get a little bit inundated with calls sometimes, so that really helped me out. Great. Thank you again, and please return uh, same time next month, uh, August 6th, for our program on plastics and what you can do to help. So Ashley, thank you. You all have a great thank night. You.